Hey everyone, welcome back to the NPTE podcast. This is Will Crane, your host. Thank you so much for joining me as we go through the content you need in order to dominate on test day. So today I've got a practice question for you. This is related to the system interactions section of the NPTE. But before we get to the practice question, welcome, welcome to the new year. So as I'm recording this, we're here at the start of 2025. I get asked all the time, what changes occur and as we go into 2025, what changes are occurring to the NPTE? Now, the truth is that the biggest changes occurred in 2024 when they had a slight change to the content outline. They, were, they started to include regenerative medicine, plus they added the scenario-based items that you'll encounter on test day. So those changes continue and will persist all the way through 2025 and beyond. Uh, chances are there will be some of you listening to this podcast well in the future, and just so you know, the content outline changes about every five years. So I anticipate that most of the stuff that we'll talk about will certainly be applicable all the way through the 2029 era. But in any case, for 2025, we will continue with the changes, which include the addition of scenario-based items, as well as uh, the addition of material like regenerative medicine and neuro, what is it, neurodiagnostic Oh my goodness, I'm blanking on the term. Uh, Electroneurodiagnostic techniques. Basically looking at nerve conduction velocity and what that means, how to interpret all that. So in any case, but today I've got a system interactions question. Uh, before we do get to that specific question, just a reminder, if you need a little extra boost in your score, if you need help going through the scenario-based items, making sure that you are up to speed on all of the content, be sure, be sure to check out PT Final Exam. You can go to ptfinalexam.com slash podcast to get all of our freebies. I think you'll enjoy those. Uh, we've got some fun cheat sheets, plus we've got some free courses available to you. Again, totally free. You may as well go over there, ptfinalexam.com slash podcast is the best way to, to get, get all that great stuff. So system interactions on the exam. Uh, this question that I've got is, the reason I put it in system interactions is because it doesn't quite fit in any of the other systems necessarily. Uh, but that being said, it, it is certainly an important one. I've actually seen other practice questions similar to it. So I wanted to make sure that you were well prepared if you encounter this on any of your practice tests or even on game day. Uh, just remember the system interactions questions, there are the system interactions section involves differential diagnosis and it has somewhere between eight and 10 questions on exam day. So definitely a section worth spending your time on. And uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and dive into our practice question. It is a short question that has a lot of implications to it. I will go ahead and read it to you, then we'll talk about the answer together. All right, a patient with a CD4 count of less than 200 cells per cubic millimeter is most likely to be diagnosed with which condition? So a patient with a CD4 count of less than 200 cells per millimeter cubed is most likely to be diagnosed with which condition? One, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Two, active staphylococcus aureus infection. Three, catheter-associated urinary tract infection or four, hemophilia. So again, a patient with a CD4 count less than 200 cells per millimeter cubed, most likely to be, to be diagnosed with which condition? And we've got acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, active staphylococcus aureus infection, catheter-associated urinary tract infection, and four, hemophilia. All right, so if you're like me, when I encountered a practice question that asked me about CD4, I had to dust off the cobwebs, try to track down what in the world CD4 is. Now, as soon as I tell you what CD4, it's a cell type, it is a type of white blood cell that we often call T cells. So if you look at the hematopoietic cells, uh, the, the pluripotent stem cells that then turn into your common uh, white blood cell subcategories on the list of that includes T cells. So T cells, a lot of times we, we classify the T cells as the, the blueprint. They're, they are what identify, they remember and identify the different uh, infections that our body encounters. And, and basically they're, they're quite involved in the, the immune response. And so someone who has a decreased immune system, <laughs> so a decrease in CD4 counts, normally they should be between 200 and 500. Once they get below 200, that would mean that you have have a decrease in these this specific type of white blood cell that is most likely to be associated with what's called acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, AIDS or AIDS. 
So acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, this is when you are infected with the HIV virus, so the human immunodeficiency virus. With an infection of HIV, what happens is that HIV specifically targets and kills CD4 cells. So often called the T cell, this is what is directly targeted by the human immunodeficiency virus. So after the infection, the virus migrates from the serums into the tissues, and from there, it starts to infect and kill CD4s, and eventually, it does a really good job at killing all of these CD4s, which leads to a progressive loss of immune system function. And that's why folks with, with AIDS, they've, they've got to be especially cautious of acquiring, uh, acquiring illness because they have a reduction in their immune system function. And so therefore, as, as a result, you've got to, usually the, the individual with AIDS requires, uh, they need to wear personal protective equipment to protect themselves from, from transmission and pathogenesis of, of what we would consider to be kind of environmental, environmental infectious or pathogens, infectious agents or pathogens that, can, that the person can encounter. Um, the, just also of note, while we're talking about AIDS, I wanted to mention that from a physical therapy perspective, there are a, quite a number of, of signs and symptoms that the person with AIDS could, could present with. And that's why this kind of fits in the system interactions because AIDS does have a lot of, of, of manifestations all the way from musculoskeletal. So we've got basically a rheumatological, uh, pre manifestation, myalgia, arthralgia, musculoskeletal pain, but maybe the most common type of sign or symptom that the patient will encounter or that will experience is what's called what's called distal sensory polyneuropathy. And so basically it's polyneuropathy that has a specific target on sensory nerves. And so the person with AIDS is very, very likely to, to have this, what do they call it? The distal sensory polyneuropathy or DSP. So with that, that means they'll have a lot of paresthesia, they'll have pain, weakness, I uh, guess so. I guess suppose there is some muscular muscular involvement, uh, leg cramping, sleep disturbances, burning pain, allodynia, hyperalge hyperalgesia. Uh, let's see, impaired sensation, both vi all vibration, pain, light touch, temperature. Uh, so basically, distal sensory polyneuropathy would be a good way to describe that. So that is one of the most common signs related to acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to mention here is that. AIDS is a bloodborne pathogen. So it means that you require standard precautions. Uh, you don't have to worry about droplet precautions or airborne precautions, um, yeah, or even contact precautions. Really, you're just using what are called standard precautions, which means that you would avoid any contamination from bloodborne pathogens, careful handling, handling of laundry, uh, avoiding needle, needle sticks. I suppose we should avoid needle sticks and sharps pretty much with every condition, but this is definitely on the list of a bloodborne pathogen. And so you'd, you would exercise what are called standard precautions. And so that means that you can still you can sh shake hands with the individual. Uh, I guess they can cough on you, but you shouldn't cough on them. <laughs> I guess no one should cough on anybody. I guess that's the moral of the story here. But uh, they are, they're actually at a high risk of, of being infected by what we'd consider are kind of a standard standard illnesses that that exist in the community. So these folks, they often are going to require personal protective equipment on their end, just as a way of of permit, preventing and decreasing the risk of contamination from the environment to them, not necessarily from them to you. If that makes any sense. These other incorrect answer options: active Staphylococcus aureus infection. Uh, that's incorrect because that would lead to an increase in white blood cell count. Uh, ostensibly, that would be an increase in CD4 cells. So chances are uh, they would have a, a CD4 count probably above 200. So if the normal range is 200 to 500, it would probably be much higher than that. Uh, Catheter-associated urinary tract infection kind of fits under the same bill here. It's a, a hospital-acquired illness, the catheter-associated urinary tract infection, meaning that there was maybe some poor handling of the, of the urinary catheter and so therefore they can develop this urinary tract infection, very likely to lead to a, a, a large immuno response. So they have an increase in white blood cell counts. And then finally, hemophilia is somewhat unrelated here because it's related to clotting factors, not directly related to white blood cells. So back to the moral of the story here, CD4 is the fancy term for T cells. T cells are part of the immune system. 
and are they're really involved in mapping out and targeting uh, targeting infectious agents uh, or cells that shouldn't be there. They they're, they're a big part of the immune response, and so uh, the human immunodeficiency virus that causes AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, that will lead to a decrease in CD4 cells. Now there clearly there's are gradations of this. You could have a non-symptomatic a non-symptomatic AIDS, which means the CD4s haven't all been destroyed yet, but as time progresses, it is likely that they will have a destruction of CD4s. So there you go. The, so back to the question, a patient with a CD4 count less than 200, most likely to be diagnosed with what? And the answer is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So just in case you, if you were like me, you had to dust off the cobwebs related to the CD4 cells, CD4, so it's Charlie David 4, CD4 cells, uh, that's often called a T cell. It's an immune, uh, uh, related to the immune immune system and is a, a subtype of white blood cell. All right, so with that, we'll bring it to a conclusion here today. Hey, be sure to check out ptfinalexam.com slash podcast for all of our cheat sheets and freebies. Plus, if you haven't yet, it only takes like one second, leave us a review, really, really helps as we're trying to get the word out about the PT final exam, the NPT podcast. Uh, so give us a give us a solid do us a solid there, and um, yeah, help us out. In the meantime, though, thanks for what you do. Thanks for going through all this pain and process to become an excellent physical therapist. I know that it will like like I say, it'll bless not only your life but the lives of your patients and their families for for years, decades to come, even generations to come. So thank you so much. Keep a grin on your chin. We'll crane fist pumps all around, and I'll catch you all in the next one. Thanks everyone.